Good afternoon, my name is Tina Parks and you're back with the Academy of Floral Art. Um, I'm back in my kitchen. Unfortunately, the lighting's not so good today, so I apologise. Um, well, the lights are still at the studio from a photo shoot we did last week. So, um, yes, I apologise a little bit lower light today. Um, so today uh, I wanted to talk about a couple of things. First of all, uh, we've decided on a name for this segment. So it's either going to be Floral uh, Spark or Floral Sparkle, because we thought kind of suits our uh, thought process for the Academy. It's got to be innovative, fun and sparkling. And that's our key things for the Academy. So we thought, why don't we call this segment uh, the Floral Spark or the Floral Sparkle? So, okay, we have a name for it, yay! <laughs> um, so today I wanted to look at a couple of different things. First of all, um, I wanted to have a look at the beautiful hydrangea. Uh, it's stunning out there at the moment and it's just about time, well, it's, we're just on the end of the time, but I thought it would be sensible to show you um, the picking of it for the drying. So as you can see, I've got some lovely, um, beautiful dry ones behind me, lots of different colours, uh, and the red colours, the darker colours, this lovely red pink tone, is probably one of the easiest ones to dry if you're looking for hydrangeas to dry for the first time. So what are they good for? Well, they're brilliant for any dried um, designs, so perfect for if you want to do a nice autumn wreath at this time of year to hang on your door, or just for a vase uh, of hydrangeas, they look really great in a room and they last about sort of easily sort of six months or so so uh, and then they start to look a little bit tatty and they go faded depending on where you're putting them the more the light position is the more faded they will get to but uh, if you can put them in a room they just add a nice um, touch and they mean that the flower goes on so it gives us really great coverage in the summer outside we have the flower on the shrub from from here in this part of England, I would say sort of probably even we start seeing them in June. Um, July, August is really when we sort of see a lot more. And then we wait until this time of year. They're best picked for using uh, in the autumn, really, when they go firm to the touch. So when you touch the top of a hydrangea, uh, I've got two that are just starting to dry here. This one's uh, got a mixture, so it's got some silky bits and some crispy bits. So this bit's a bit silky still here. When you touch the hydrangea, the top of hydrangea, if it feels silky like a fabric, then it's not quite ready to pick. They are slightly better when they've had a little bit of cold weather, and then it helps to get the color to go really deep. Uh, this one was more of a bluey tone, and you can see the tone of the color underneath it started at more blue-green and then it's gone more red as this where it's touched by the cold this is where you get this lovely red tone on it so this is the perfect head to pick it's just a little bit going over because there's a few little odd brown flowers in there so uh, so this is perfect so you need to hear it needs to feel crispy when you touch it it needs to feel a bit sort of crunchy when you touch it and that means it's perfect time to pick it and it will dry the best for you. So uh, I dry them in a vase of water. So I leave the stems long, cut them as long as I can. I just put them in a vase of water with a, a couple of inches of uh, a vase, a couple of inches of water on the bottom. Now they will drink up quite a bit. So you can either do them two ways. You can either keep topping them up until they start getting crispy and then let them drain the water out. Well, some people prefer the tip of just letting them put a couple of inches of water and just let them drink it up naturally and don't refill. I tend to like to dry them upright. Uh, they get this lovely, nice head. As long as the stem is pretty straight, it should stay straight for you. They don't tend to bend over. And uh, but it'll just dry beautifully. So this is in the part way. You can see the stem's still quite green. Um, this is a part way dried one, so it's got some bits that are dry. You can hear they're really crispy bits and some bits such as still they're still silky like this piece is not crispy can you hear that it's not crispy it's still slightly soft so that it's just in the process of drying you'll know when it's dry when it's totally crisp 
So you need to pick the hydrangea when it's at its best. What happens if you don't get them at the best is this. So this is a good example. So he's beautifully dried, this green one. I find the green are harder to dry. So when you, if you're drying them for the first time, then I tend to go for the red ones because they dry the easiest. But this lovely, this was a white one originally and it's gone green. Um, this has dried beautifully. So can you see it's all nice and neat. There's no brown ones in there. It's dried beautifully. This one has picked a little bit too late. Can you see there's brown in him? See underneath there's, there's brown bits in it. So when it's drying, it's not drying so well because there's lots of brown bits in. Now when it's on so it's not too bad because we could pick those bits off and just and you still get a nice head then but you can just see that some of it's turned a bit there so that was a little bit not perfect when i picked it it's a bit wet so you want to wait till it's dry before you pick them and then they'll dry better and this one was picked too late can you see what's happened to this one this one's gone over completely it's brown I think these ones are a little bit harder to dry. I think this sort of pinky tone, this lilac one, the blue green ones, I think are hardest to dry. Um, but they do they do dry. They just take a little bit more care. This one obviously was too far gone when I picked him. Can you see? He's, he's really not good. So that shows you if you if you pick it too late or too early, then this is what happens. They just shrivel rather than holding that nice shape for them. So yeah. Um, and then we can do all sorts of things. So this, these guys, if it's got a bit of marking on there, a couple of things you can do is you could spray it. So it takes spray paint really, really well. Lovely for a Christmas wreath. So if you are looking to make your own Christmas wreath this year and you haven't got so much foliage, why don't you cut a few of the hydrangeas from the garden? You can give this a little shush with a little spray paint. So a gold, rose gold's very trendy this year or a bronze or a silver, whatever you want to go with your, your colours, just slightly shush it a couple of times with the spray. So slightly light and spray the paint over it very in sort of gentle movement, sort of flick it over. So you don't want to spray it too hard on here. You want to just coat it slightly. You want to essence it rather than make it solid. Um, and, and that will give you a nice effect then. But they look really pretty with that, with the, with the gold, silver, bronze, any of the nice Christmas colours on there. The metallic colours look good. And then that's perfect to put into your Christmas wreath then. It will fill out nicely because each of these heads is really big. We can still cut them down into the little florets inside to make them smaller for when you're making them in the design. But you can either wire or glue those in then and they will fill out your lovely Christmas wreath for you and mean that you won't need as much foliage in there. So that's a really nice little uh, tip now to go and pick them, well maybe not today because we've had a lot of rain here today, but if it has a dry for a couple of days then I would go and get them, go and pick them and then start drying them so it makes a, a really useful filler. So that's the hydrangeas. Um, they're really, they, they're such a good plant. When I, it's so funny, when I first started in the forestry, they weren't in fashion at all. I remember my, uh, my gran had one and my mum had some in her garden and I used to think they were big old clumpy things. But now I really appreciate using them. I love breaking them down. They make beautiful texture in things and they make a beautiful depth in, in materials. So you can use them really low down into arrangement to give you that colour and that depth of uh, material really deep and low great in headdress work uh, dried they're brilliant you can glue them like we said or wire them they last really well so they're very very good and they're super super light as a material as well so good for things you're going to carry or wear so the good old hydrangea comes into twice so we not only can enjoy the flower in its season but we can also draw, enjoy the flower once it's dry as well we're also coming into Halloween here, so I've got a lovely big pumpkin here. So this is starting to get ready for Halloween. Um, the boys will be coming uh, on Friday and we will definitely be carving a couple of these. So that should be really good fun. But I was just playing with an idea that I did actually a few years ago, uh, probably ooh, maybe four years ago now. And we were looking at the level five. We were looking at concave. Now on the level five, um, list of designs they have to do. There's a whole tick sheet of different things that they have to explore. 
which is really great because they're not complicated, but what they make you do is explore different thought processes around doing things in a different way or starting from a different start point. It doesn't have to be complicated, but what it offers you is an opportunity to explore something, thinking at something a little bit different. And one of the things they have to do is concave. Now, concave means the inside curve. So if you're imagining a circle or even a rectangle, it's the inside space that we're looking at rather than the outside. So quite often we might decorate the outside of something. We'll put something on, on top of the, the pumpkin or we make a hole in the pumpkin for the foam and then we bring the flower out over the top. But we were looking at concave and thinking about what would give us a concave shape to work to. So we were looking at things like bridal bouquets, making them concave rather than things like, we see the spheres quite a lot with the flowers over the overlaying uh, at the top. But we were also thinking about what could go on the inside of the sphere, so we hollowed it out. And thinking about that with a natural product at this time of year, of course, the very thing we thought about was the pumpkins, because we do hollow these guys out. So this is a big one. This is a monster one. It's fairly big, it's a decent sized one, Teresa. I'm not sure I'd call it a monster, but it's a decent sized one. Um, so I didn't want to use something as big as that, but we used something a little bit smaller. And then we kept with the circle theme. So we were thinking the pumpkins round, basically, and we were thinking about what could we use inside that would be round. And following the theme of the season, I'm just going to put the big pumpkin over there up away a little so I can have a bit of space. We have created this little chart. So on a tray, always, it's quite interesting when we're looking at level five, we also look at how to display and set the piece of work rather than just having the piece of work. So for photographs and things. So I've displayed it onto a tray. I've got these beautiful uh, magnolia leaves that have rolled and curled, dried, again, naturally dried, which have the most amazing colour on the back. It's like a sort of pale blue brown colour and then a really dark colour on the inside, really dark brown. And they just have this beautiful sort of shape when they curve up. Can you see that? They twist around beautifully and they're really, really lovely. So they make a really interesting uh, base to work with. So I've just put it on the tray and I've just set it in amongst these lovely leaves. I'm just going to come closer. So what we've done is, in fact, actually, if I just pick up the pumpkin so you can see, what we've done is we've filled the inside with the berries. Can you see? It's like jewels. Can you see that there? Hopefully that's good. Oh, yeah. So all little berries inside. So we've taken the seasonal fruit and we thought about things that are seasonal in, in currently at the moment, so in the autumn. And the berries are very, very strong this year. They're really good. There's lots of different ones out there. So we've used a whole range. So we've got all sorts of things in here. So we've got uh, blackberries of different varying colours, so right from green to black. We've got uh, little rose hips. We've got cotoneaster berries. We've got little seed pods from the... Um, Crocosnia, we've got uh, some oh, a couple of different rose hips in there. We've got a few little seeds from the. I've got a little one loose there. He's rolling around. Let's take him out. We've got a few little seeds from the the Gaultheria, the berries from the Gaultheria, which is a sort of nice plant at the moment. I had some on the table the other week, um, which has got little berries on there. So all I did with this is I soaked, is I scraped out the uh, centre of the uh, uh, pumpkin, like we would for an ordinary pumpkin, and left us with a sort of harder skin, if you like, on the outside. And then we've put uh, the uh, little berries wedged in. So some of them have got little stalks on, so I've used the little rose hips with the stalk on, so I could push the stalk into the pumpkin to hold the material, almost like wedging the material in place. And then I've used the berries to wedge in. I have a little bit, because I knew we were using this on camera today, I've cheated a little bit at the top. I've actually glued the very top line in to hold them in place. But most of that is actually wedged in. So it's just holding itself, it, it, itself in place, which is quite amazing. With a little bit of um, inserting with the steps, some of the, the rosehip stalks, some of the larger ones, I've just pushed down a bit better into the 
into the flesh and just were holding everything in place. So it looks really nice. And I think it just looks really interesting. And it would make a really nice uh, little piece. It's not a big pump. It's not a big pumpkin. Can you see? It's only a little one there. It's not that big. You see the size of my hand with the size of the pumpkin. Uh, probably took me about probably maybe about an hour last night uh, just to to make him and uh, just literally f feeding everything in really there. One little bear in there's quite white. Maybe I'll take him out because he's a little bit strong in there. But all the other berries are more the reds. We're looking for the reds, the greens, the deep dark colours. There's a few blueberries in there just to add a little of the richer colour in there. But just what a nice little uh, feature piece. Nice little talking point, quite sweet for a coffee table. So you look into it. So somewhere where you'd look down on it would be nice. Some, somewhere you could look into it. It sits on its side slightly so it's tilted. Um, so you can get the, the full sort of site inside of it, but just a really nice concept. So we were trying to think about all the things that related together. So the autumnal fruit with the, the base, the structure, the pumpkin and autumnal materials inside in the autumnal colours. So we've got the oranges, the reds, right the way through to a dark red. So we're along the Angolius colour scheme, but we've gone red orange right the way through to um, red. And a little, there's a tiny, tiny touch of yellow orange in there, a little tiny, tiny touch, and a tiny, tiny amount of green, which we could say was a discourse colour because he belongs on the opposite side of the colour wheel. Or we could just say that it's the you know natural um, foliage colour that we would see in there. So it's quite nice uh, as a nice little focal piece. And it just is, just shows you that you can really play with the idea, but it can still be simple, but it just gives you a bit of a different idea to, to play with. So um, also I was going to say, um, last week we did some book, we showed started folding the um, book and I had a few different requests about how to fold it. Now we had a really nice, uh, lovely workshop with Judy Spires the other day and we were talking about book folding because she was saying she'd folded a book and she had said that she'd used a magazine and I thought, oh, that's a really interesting idea. Um, so all you're doing, this is just my notebook I'm working in, so I'm just going to show you. So it just, I've got an A4 book here and all we're doing is just literally taking the page and we're folding it over. So what we tend to do is, what I've done is I fold it over once like that. So I measure it down the side of the spine, fold it once. Let me give you a crease there. and then fold it really nice you need to nicely crease it so that's just literally the other the side of the top of the page coming down mirroring up the spine and then you can fold it again so then the second fold dictates how wide you want your tree to be so if you fold it again exactly in line with your spine like so so i folded it over again so effectively we've got two folds here folded it twice that will be a, how a, a quarter of your tree width will be. So it gives you an idea. So you can fold it more if you want a tighter one, or you can fold it wider if you want it to be a really little fat dumpy one. So think about your height. And some people fold the bottoms up. So you see this piece right here, you've got a triangular piece, which is, if I close the book, you see it's below the level of the book. So if you want to, you can fold that up and tuck it in so that it's flat with your base there. Or you can leave it sticking out because what it can do for you is it can become part of your base structure. And you go all the way around. So that's just one page I folded. And I would just keep folding the whole book all the way around. And then what we do with the spine is we glue the spine to each other. So you glue both sides and your book will, and the thing becomes three dimensional because it goes all the way around then. So it'll open all the way up. So it makes a really interesting piece. I'm going to have a go at a magazine because I thought actually that would be really good. Um, and it looks a bit boring done with this plain book, but I just wanted to show you because um, the, there's no writing on here. So it doesn't look so interesting, but on the magazines, you've got pictures, it's colorful. And, or if you do an ordinary book, you've got the lovely writing in the book, which looks really interesting, makes it look really nice. 
So that's just how you fold the book ready to go. And you just keep going round. Now, some of the pages on the book I was folding, that big one, uh, the novel that I had last week, I was actually folding two pages at once because it was quite thin paper and it was just quicker to do it that way. But if your paper is thick, then you might have to fold one at a time. So it's definitely a good job to do in the evening if you've got a minute. So having a sit, sit down with a cup of tea and just, and just folding the paper, it's quite therapeutic. It's quite nice to do. Um, and you can make all sorts of different bits. And uh, Judith also gave me a really another nice, interesting idea. She said that you could use it as a card holder. So you could make them and then slip your cards into them all the way around. So your little your gift cards could slide into each of the folds um, all the way around. So that could be quite interesting because on a, on a table that could have you all your lovely Christmas cards all coming out uh, around one sort of central piece. So that could be a quite nice way to display the cards. So I thought that was a really nice idea too. So thank you very much for those. Uh, thank you so much for your lovely comments. It's been really great. Now, next time, we're not here next week because it's half term, but we are here the week after and it will be Julie Collins. And Julie is going to be having a look at um, the build up to Christmas again. So, but she's going to be taking you through some quick and simple designs for Christmas. So little ideas that you can make at home. Um, and we're also going to be talking to you about our um, Christmas film, which you can uh, purchase. And the idea is that we'd like to give some of that money to charity. Excuse me. So we're going to show you how to decorate your Christmas table, all the tips and tricks. We're going to show you how to decorate your Christmas tree, including different ways with the lighting, because there's lots of different ways you can do it. So I'm going to tell you my top three and give you my best one, I think. And also we're going to show you how to make a, top, a table arrangement for Christmas as well. So uh, this is going to be coming out shortly, but we're still looking for an idea for our charity. Now we've had some people PM us some ideas. Thank you so much for those that have come in. But we're going to make a decision next week. So if you've got any charities you think that you would like uh, us to support, we're looking for something really that's sort of environmentally friendly, something that's doing some project with the environment in our area, if you can, sort of in the Devon area or somewhere in the southwest area. Um, and what we're looking for is just ideas. So if you'd like to send us some ideas, we're going to narrow them down next week and we're going to put our probably our top three or four and then we're going to put it to vote so we're going to let you choose which one you would like us to support or would like you to support um, and then we will let you know um, how to buy the film so it's going to cost about 20 pounds and you can it's a great little gift for someone um, so you can uh, buy the film and then a major chunk of that i think it's about 85 percent after vat is going to go to the charity. So just to give you a bit of an idea. So we'll clarify all that down. We're just in uh, talks with a few different people at the moment. Um, and we're gonna be filming the film next week or the end of next week, so beginning uh, just after half term. Uh, and then we will have it up to buy on our website, hopefully about the middle week of November. So I'm hoping that might be of interest to you. So thank you very much for viewing. Um, we look forward to seeing you again. So have a really great half term for those of you who are having a break. And we will see you back in November. So thank you very much for tuning in. Bye-bye.